1981, it's high school prom night, and a group of teenagers find themselves being stalked by a masked killer. 1982, a group of girls plan a slumber party, but they're unaware that they're being preyed upon. 1983, a young girl called Angela visits sleepaway camp. 1981, Valentine's Day, a group of teens find themselves being picked off. Christmas, 1984, a killer dressed as Santa Claus terrorizes. It's graduation day, 1981. After the success of Halloween and then Friday the 13th, the slasher had officially become a genre, a trend, a phenomenon. Filmmakers and studios had all clocked on to the fact that a small budget, a cast of unknowns, some decent gore effects, and a very simple story in which kids get offed one by one was a hugely bankable concept. And so began the slasher boom of the early 80s. Between the years of 1980 and 1985, over 100 slasher movies were released in theatres, all with essentially the same premise. Some of these slashers had some original interesting spins on the genre, some were conventional but solid, and some were complete and utter trash. But no matter how the quality varied, audiences always flocked to the cinema to find out what other possible ways filmmakers could think of to dismember teenagers. Join me as we continue exploring the evolution of the slasher and delve into the early 80s slasher mania. You may think you're safe, but you're dead wrong. Welcome back to the evolution of horror. My name is Mike, and as ever, I am your host. If you're joining us for the first time, then welcome. In this podcast, we dissect and explore the history and evolution of the horror genre by delving into particular subgenres across a number of weeks. We're currently in the midst of exploring the evolution of the slasher, and this is part eight, in which we're going to explore the early 80s slasher boom. This was the era that was so overpopulated with these cheap, crowd-pleasing slasher movies that it was virtually impossible for me to pick just one or two to cover in detail. So instead, I thought I'd change up the format slightly. We're going to do a spoiler-free overview of this whole era in which my guest is going to recommend a handful of his very favourite 80s slashers. Before we get started, though, please don't forget you can always get in touch anytime. The email address is evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. You can find us on Twitter at evolutionpod and on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash evolutionofhorror. And as ever, I'm going to do a little thank you to everyone that has dropped a lovely iTunes review this week, including Shatterhand55, The Jace, Stephen Greger, Miles Schmiles, and David Lynch. How lovely for David Lynch to have taken time out of his very busy schedule. I mean, he's directed 18 hours of brilliant television this year, and yet apparently he still found the time to listen to my podcast and leave a five-star review. So that is really quite a treat. Thanks, David. What the hell? Okay, time to introduce my guest for this week. He's been on the podcast before, and it's a huge treat to have him back. This was the man behind the incredible Stephen King season that ran all through the month of September at the British Film Institute. He's also the man behind the even more incredible Cult Strand at the London Film Festival. He's the master when it comes to horror, genre, exploitation, and is definitely the best equipped person to accompany me on this journey through 80s slashers. It is my great pleasure to welcome back the brilliant Michael Blythe. Michael, hello. Hello again. Good to see you again. We're back in the BFI broom cupboard. We're at our favourite place. So last time I spoke to you, obviously, we were discussing the upcoming Stephen King season and LFF. I mean, you know, and now that's all over. Sad times. It is. Were you pleased with how the Stephen King season went? I mean, it got so much good response. Yeah, it was amazing. I mean, I think... You know, it was so exciting to, like you said, see it get such a good response. And, um, you know, the kind of press was really great for it. And I think there was a lot of people talking about a lot of kind of interest. And, you know, it just came at the perfect time. It was uh, September was the month of Stephen King. And it was just really good for the BFI to be part of the zeitgeist for once so cool it you know, was leading so the cool. way not trailing behind it was absolutely yeah what was the highlight for you out of everything that, that sort of took place across the september um i think probably the highlight was the preview for gerald's game that we yeah. did which i think is really extraordinary i love the film and i'm a big what fan a of yeah. it's great isn't it and i'm a big fan of mike flanagan 
And it was really exciting because obviously it's a Netflix movie, yeah. so it's a very it was a very rare chance for it to see it on the big screen. Yeah. And and Mike came along and he was kind of saying that this is his one chance to watch it with an audience. So yes. he sat in and watched it, and yes. it was great. There's a really nice atmosphere in the audience. I think people really responded to it. Amazing. And we also obviously through October had the LFF. We had you were in charge of the cult strand of movies, amazing movies. What was your favourite? I mean, what you know, what movie kind of stood out for you out of the bunch that you picked? Um, I think this year actually was a really strong year for, yeah. the, for the Colt Strand. I think it was real kind of hit after hit um, as far as I was concerned. But Brawl in Cell Block 99 yes. was a big favourite of mine. Um, so the new one from S. Craig Zala who made Bone Tomahawk, yeah. which we screened in the festival a few years ago. And, um, and this is just him doing a kind of similar thing again but Mm -hmm. at the same time bringing something completely unexpected completely fresh completely new whereas his first film was a kind of cannibal horror western this is like a um a kind of all-out prison thriller yes but like none you've ever seen before yeah it's it's just absolutely i love like just the conviction s craig zala puts into these movies and the story's so simple but also what's brilliant is that the, the dialogue is so excellent and like i get so drawn in to the dialogue and characters and then i'm taken by surprise at just how gory his movies get yeah well. it's it, amazing i think he's so good at pacing as well because yeah. i think his the pacing of his films is so unlike any other films that are being made at the moment they yeah. really take their time but it's not slow cinema no you know they're completely engaging they're completely interesting but there's just kind of these lulls in them that are so perfectly timed and it means that when the violence comes it's it really hits hard and yes. i think Brawl in Cell Block 99 has some of the most shocking moments of on-screen violence I've probably ever seen. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, same. It's absolutely brilliant. Huge recommendation for anyone listening that didn't get to see it. It is a brilliant film. And the best Vince Vaughn has ever been, I think. Probably, 100%. You know. <laughs> um, so let's get started. So this week we're talking all things 80s slashers. Now, you were on the podcast a few weeks ago, Michael, and you gave us our kind of slasher 101, I suppose, a kind of broad overview of of the slashes, how they evolved and where they're at now, how they begun, gave us a kind of brief history, which worked really well as an intro. But we're going in depth now into, I think what you mentioned was your favourite era of the slashes, which is the early 80s slasher boom. Um, so first of all, before we get into some recommendations from you, um, I want to hear a little bit, we've touched on this already, but just where are we at? at the moment in the history of the slasher why did this boom suddenly happen what was the reason for it what was the kind of feeling out there amongst movie studios and distributors at this point in terms of slashers so i think the cynical part of me would say a couple of these films came along they were big hits yes and then hollywood does the classic thing it does and tries to recreate and expand on and deliver more of and did so in kind of increasingly strange desperate perverse exciting yes unexciting ways and yes. you know i think that the kind of wave of films that followed from particularly halloween and then the major one which was friday the 13th in yeah. terms of kind of box office revenue and being the one that really kind of hit big you know the, the films that came after were trying to kind of emulate that success and the best way they could do it was to give more of the same plus more you know to make it more extreme more violence more nudity more gore more fun yeah absolutely do that they they became i suppose after friday the 13th it feels like i mean is it fair to say that these movies basically became about the spectacle of the kills i think the one thing they all have in common is the gore aspect don't they yeah absolutely and i think that's why you know people call them slasher movies but people call them body count movies yeah yeah, and i think you know when you look at the majority of stuff that was being made in this kind of period between you know kind of from the early 80s up to the kind of mid to uh mid to late 80s it were they were body count films you know Mm -hmm. these are kind of invariably in non- anonymous characters yeah. that are served up just so we can watch them die. There's a special night in the lives of all of us. A night to be beautiful, to be desirable. A night we can break all the rules and make our own. Prom night. Prom night, terror train, happy birthday to me, um, April Fool's Day, the initiation, final exam, all these kind of millions of films that came out. Yeah. You know, inevitably they were all or mostly um, college or kind of sorority set. Yeah. They would trade in on these kind of classic tropes that came about. So this idea of um, important dates when yes. people would come back, whether they were kind of holidays or anniversaries of terrible incidents. Is there any calendar date that they that they didn't cover with the slasher film? Because I pretty much, I mean, we've pretty much covered everything, didn't we? Yeah, there must be. I'm trying to think if there was a, a particularly good one. Have we had, has there been a good Easter slasher film? I was wondering that. There I can't really think be. of any Easter 
Easter horror films. I mean, I guess there's Night of the Lepers with the kind of yeah. killer rabbit. So you could kind of, there's like an Easter <laughs> twist on that. But yeah. I can't really think of a good Easter. Well, do you know what? The Passion of Christ is bordering on torture porn. Well, exactly. <laughs> Eva! Eva! One terrifying night of unspeakable evil. New Year's Evil. I mean, these were cheap movies that yeah. were kind of quick turnaround. These weren't kind of huge studio productions mm-hmm. that would be kind of months in development and filming and yeah. the kind of promotional parts behind them. You know, they they were shot cheap and quickly and then yeah. kind of got out as soon as they could. So a lot of these were picked up by studios subsequently. So they yes. weren't these kind of big high profile productions. And I think that helped with the kind of turnaround. And it also meant because the formula was so... had had been kind of perfected pretty early on, there were basic rules which filmmakers had to kind of to play with and mm-hmm. to comply with to a certain extent so you could kind of get these turned around really quickly and you wouldn't have to put a huge amount of effort into them yes. necessarily yes um, i sound like i'm being dismissive obviously i love they're these brilliant. films and i think there are some brilliant ones in there but a lot of them weren't exactly overflowing with imagination no no and uh, also it does it feels like one of those things as well where it's a lot of filmmakers first time filmmakers and also first time actors like you've got a lot of these movies feature now very recognizable faces haven't mm. they as well yeah i was great. just i was just watching um god i can't remember what it's called now it's the it's an uh, it's a kind of um woods set slasher film and mm. daryl hannah's in it oh Can wow you know which one that is is it no. the, fi- the final terror oh right I think yeah it is. oh yeah, yeah um yeah it was was pretty unextraordinary yeah um but you know interesting in some degrees and always nice to see a famous face pop up and get killed absolutely it always is last week we were talking about friday the 13th and kevin bacon obviously getting killed in that famous scene and actually i wondered if i could just ask you briefly before we get into some of the picks for these other non-franchise slashes i suppose let me ask you a little bit about the two big franchises that existed at this point friday the 13th and halloween obviously both of them had sequels that came out during this era what are your general thoughts on those friday and halloween sequels i mean i think the uh, in terms of friday the 13th i mean it's i've got to be honest it's not my favorite franchise of all yeah. time um there's moments in it i like i like a few other movies but you know what's interesting about friday the 13th and kind of what's interesting about halloween as well mm. is kind of you know, with Halloween with part three and with Friday the 13th part five, they both tried to do a thing where they were going to rewrite the rules of the franchise. They were going to do something different. So, and kind of most specifically, both of those films don't feature the killer that we would expect. I mean, they do so in, or don't do so in in quite different ways, but Mm -hmm. neither of them actually feature Michael or um, or Jason. So I think there was a kind of effort on the part of these franchises to try and do something different Mm. and to not just rest on these laurels and not just to say, oh, these kids will just watch anything. We'll just do the same thing over and over again. There was a desire to do something different. I think, yeah, And I think it doesn't always work. I think Halloween 3 is really interesting and I think it's a great standalone film, but it's bizarre to think about it as a Halloween movie. Yeah. Um, Friday the 13th Part 5 is a a huge disaster as far as I'm concerned. And it's kind of one of those things where I think both of them responded to the fact that fans did want the killer. They did Mm. want the rules. They did want the kind of the safety that they had established with these um, these kind of set stock types of that were happening throughout the film so actually they both responded quickly and brought back yeah. kind of what the fans wanted yeah it's so true isn't it you, you, there, there obviously is this kind of dispute as you get with any movies i suppose but between the kind of directors and writers and the producers where you've got yeah you know maybe they did try and add a bit of creativity or something original and then it just failed miserably didn't yeah, it on exactly. both those counts yeah, you know yeah. i think i kind of you've got to admire them for trying I yeah guess, definitely maybe sometimes you think they could have tried a little harder uh, yeah though, that's true particularly with friday the third yeah i mean that's the thing with halloween i think now there's a bit of love for halloween 3 again i think in hindsight isn't yeah there? absolutely it's such a strange film it's yeah. such a kind of weird you know it's a very kind of um there's not a lot of other things that you can compare it with mm-hmm. and i think that's kind of what's interesting about it is whereas this had come from a, a slasher franchise where there was a million other things like at the time mm-hmm. and I think the fact that they decided to do something that completely stood out on its own was yeah. was interesting yeah, 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 you know I don't think it's a perfect film but I think it's a you know a kind of one that definitely benefits revisiting it could have been interesting couldn't it because I think the I think the original plan was that the, then it was going to be a different story like Halloween was going to turn into a kind of anthology series wasn't it which would have been quite good yeah and I think and the other thing I like about Halloween 3 is I think because it was the whole thing that it was written originally was written by Nigel Neal mm-hmm. who Carpenter was a big fan of yes. and had kind of wanted to 
to work with him and you know Carpenter has Nigel Neal references throughout his work yeah and um, apparently he was just the worst person in the world he was awful oh. to work with and apparently Carpenter had a horrible horrible time with him right and um, Nigel Neal was quite vocal about how dismissive he was <laughs> of Carpenter's work and all these kind of different things and you know there's something deeply sad about it yeah and um you know, Carpenter's kind of subsequently talked about how he will always love Nigel Neal and what he brought and he'll love Quatermass in the Pit and all these different things yeah. that Neil did. But as a person, he just says he was the worst. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, okay, well, um, let's get into some of your recommendations then. So we've got a, a little list here um, of some of your favourites and we're not going to talk spoilers for any of these. So they'll just be sort of brief recommendations for some of our, our favourite 80s horror movies. So what's the first one you're going to recommend? What's your favourite of this bunch, first of all? Um, one of my favourite favourites is Slumber Party Massacre. One thing's for sure, no one's getting any sleep the night of the Slumber Party Massacre. Close your eyes for a second and sleep forever. Which is a great film, a um, really interesting film, which was actually written and directed by women. And I think it originated as... It was It was originally intended to be a kind of slasher parody. Mm-hmm. Um, but then Roger Corman came on board as a producer and kind of took away some of that aspect. Yeah. Kind of upped the nudity, upped the kind of gore. Roger that kind Corman of did it a bit. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> yeah. what's interesting is you kind of see these women making this film under the constraints of this man who's trying to give audiences what they want. Mm. And these women are saying, hey, actually, we can give them something more. Mm. We can give them something they don't know that they want. And I think it's a kind of awkward mix, but it's one that makes the film so exciting to watch. Hey, Linda. Yeah. Do you like watching basketball on TV? Yeah, I love all those great big guys in their cute little shorts. How about you? Yeah, I do. But I love football. How come? Brian Sipes, he's a dog. Yeah, I know what you mean. God, I wish he took his helmet off more often. <laughs> hey, you want to go to a party tonight? Uh, where's it going to be? White House. Oh, uh, I don't know. I've got to study. i got to test on Monday. Trish, can I have the I think the thing about the Slumber Party Massacre that really sets it apart from a lot of the other slash films at the time, which were really labelled as being kind of misogynist, Mm -hmm. women-hating trash, was that actually the girls in this film are pretty interesting. Mm. They're, They're resourceful, as most women in slash films are, but there is something about the relationship they have with each other that's interesting. They talk to each other. They have really substantial friendships with Mm -hmm. each other and they rely on each other and count on each other and what's interesting about slumber party massacre is you're not left with a final girl you're left with final girls there's like three of them i think survive at the end of that film and they look at each other as though they've shared this traumatic experience yeah but their bond their relationship is going to be stronger because of it I think there's something um, really kind of interesting in that. And I think it's something which if you were to watch the film, you might just immediately look at the, you know, the kind of shower scenes and the kind of gratuitous fawning over the kind of naked female bodies. But even that is kind of done with a slight knowing wink and a slight kind of irony there but i think there's actually some kind of substance behind it um what just very briefly could you just give me a little bit of for people that don't know have never heard of slumber party massacre i mean the title pretty much sums up what <laughs> right, it is you're, you're never gonna guess so it's a group of girls having a slumber party yeah and there's a killer on the loose there you go. who comes along he's his his weapon of choice is a huge phallic drill yes it is much uh much joy can be taken from that um i mean if you look at the poster for slumber party massacre which is a shot from between the killer's legs where mm-hmm. you can see the drill kind of pointing down and yeah. the three women like cowering between his legs. Yeah. And this this um, post image was actually shot by Amy Holden Jones who directed the film. Mm-hmm. So it's very, she was very conscious of what she was doing. She knew that this drill was a big dick yeah. and she knew exactly what she was doing. And I think it's interesting as well because people talk about, you know, the kind of Freudian implications of horror movies or they talk yeah. about the kind of, um, you know, the kind of phallic, nature of the, mm. the knife and the blade and, and whatever it might be but with some point massacre she was she was making subtext text yes you know she was like i know exactly what i'm doing here and by by being so brazen about it it kind of um in some way t- takes the power away mm-hmm. from the guy mm. you know it, it puts the power 
all in these kind of girls' hands, mm-hmm. it, um, it castrates the killer. We briefly mentioned this before, but it's it feels like one of the few of this time that focuses more on the on the heroines than the killer as well. You don't really know know or care about the killer, do you? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something that makes it so interesting, and that kind of leads on to my another one of my recommendations, which is uh, House on Sorority Row. Okay, perfect. Which is one that I really like, and again, it's a slasher film that's set in this kind of very female centric world. Mm-hmm. A certain kind of girl joins Pi Theta sorority, a girl who likes to party and likes to get close to her friends, a girl whose extracurricular activities were more daring than most, a girl who could turn her fantasies into reality. One more sling won't set us back, any. Then again, Pi Theta was different from other sororities. I'll get back at you the last thing I do! Because in this sorority, nothing is off limits. As long as it's fun for the girls. So when it came time to say goodbye, they decided to make real sure that no one would ever forget the girls in the house on Sorority Row. Um, set in a sorority house, and it's a classic slasher narrative of a prank that goes wrong. Mm-hmm. Which leads to kind of you know uh, revenge possibly at the hands of the one who was pranked. Yes. Um, so you know the, the the sap is very familiar as with Summer Party Massacre, but again with House on Sorority Row, there's a real investment in these women mm-hmm. in their stories, and actually they have quite defined personalities, and they're kind of separate people that are drawn fairly well in the kind of limited time that is given. Mm-hmm. So I think what's interesting both about both of these films is how so often in slasher films people and particularly women are isolated Mm -hmm. these films occur in situations where the women are constantly together and constantly talking about what's going on and constantly trying to work out as a team how to fight through and overcome what they're doing so actually these are kind of very much Bechdel test approved slasher movies yeah, yeah, yeah. So true. It's so interesting, which, again, is not something you'd necessarily expect from these movies. Uh, OK, what's next on your list? I love it. You've actually written down an actual list on a notepad there for your slashes. That's brilliant. I was so worried that I was going to get here and be like, oh, I can't think of anything. And then I'd go away being like, oh, man, I didn't mention, you know, Pieces or something. Yeah, no, Speaking that's of great. which, Pieces, what a great film that is. Warning. What you will see in the movie Pieces cannot be revealed, cannot be described. Cannot even be imagined. And you don't have to go to Texas for a chainsaw massacre. Pieces. It's exactly what you think it is. Pieces. Absolutely no one under 17 will be admitted. Great. So, which is a... a, um 80s slash film very much in the kind of giallo tradition Mm. but without any of the class or style (laughs) or sophistication it's hands down one of the most inept films ever made but brilliantly so but it has flashes of genius Mm -hmm. in it. these moments which look really incredible Mm. followed by the most ridiculous moment you've ever seen it's um you know usually i I take kind of film watching very seriously and you know anyone that's kind of watched a film with me knows that i'm constantly like shh shh, get off your phone whereas i would absolutely recommend that you get drunk get some friends around and watch pieces because you'll have the best night of your life that's so true as well isn't it and branching off again you know slasher movies do you think that they're they're better to watch with other people than on your own. Um, maybe for most people. I mean, me. I, a I can't think of anything that I would do more <laughs> than kind of stay in all weekend and just watch slash movies on my own. But no, definitely. I think there is a kind of... Cause, because they're so simple and because they're so easy to follow most of the time, mm-hmm. you can have a kind of running commentary through them you can talk yeah. about them you can laugh you can be like why are they doing that i mean that's one of the great pleasures of flashing movies isn't it yeah. that's why scream was partly so successful because it knows what people are saying and thinking while people are watching yeah. movies. so it's quite fun to have someone to to kind of watch that with and to to kind of comment on you know i think there are a lot of slasher films that that actually demand a bit more attention than that and that you should kind of sit silently and pay attention to i think um the initiation is one that i think is a really interesting Ooh, i don't think um, i've seen the initiation. really interesting one it's Daphne Zuniga is in it and um, it's very much a kind of Freudian psychoanalytical Mm -hmm. slasher movie um, with with quite a lot going on in it there's about eight different subplots which actually managed to come together quite successfully Mm -hmm. and that's that's one that um, I often recommend to people okay it's a a really smart little film what was the one we were just talking pieces Uh, what's the kind of most memorable set piece in pieces for you would you say 
it's not really a set piece, but there is, <laughs> it's really hard to explain. I'm not going to try and do the impression of the woman, but there is a <laughs> moment where the one of the, the characters who's really upset about what's going on and these kind of deaths that are going, mm. um, starts screaming bastard at the top of her lungs repeatedly. <laughs> and it goes on for a really weird amount of time that it, it becomes literally one of the funniest scenes that's ever existed in Wonderful. cinema history. So it's a fun example of where the best moment in a slasher movie isn't actually a death. A death. You see it? Yes! While we were out here fumbling with that music... The lousy bastard was in there killing her! Bastard! 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 I, I watched it a long time ago when I was a teenager. I remember nothing about it, so yeah. I will have to revisit that one. Oh yeah, go one. back to it. It's, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's got a lot to give. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, next, next on your list. Um, I think Final Exam is, a, mm-hmm. is an interesting one. Um, Final Exam's an interesting one because it came, you know, kind of slap bang in the middle of the of the boom. Mm-hmm. But what's notable about that one is actually the, the kind of gore and violence is really downplayed mm. and character is, you know, it takes kind of centre stage. Yep. And maybe a lot of people listening to this will be rolling their eyes and be like, why would I want to watch that then? But actually it's really interesting and there's um, there's some characters that you really kind of grow to care about. At Lanier College, they have the finest security, the best teacher-student relations, no fraternity hazing, strictly enforced curfews, Shh. What's that? and a killer. He's come back. Final exam. When are you going to realize that the whole world isn't made of psychopaths? By the end, it, it's actually kind of weirdly moving, I found it. So I think Final Exam is is an example of um, when kind of slasher movies try and offer something more than just the kills. Yeah. Um, and another one that I really love... Um, which came a bit later, which was in 1987, I think, um, and is a little bit kind of aside from the ones that we're talking about, which are all kind of teens and yeah. kind of America, and this kind of thing, which is Stage Fright, which is the yeah. Michaela Suave film, um, which he was a kind of protege of Dario Argento. Yeah. And Stage Fright was his first film, and it's set in a, a kind of old, a kind of abandoned theatre. Yeah. And one of the best slasher killers is uh, is the killer in that one who wears a big owl, owl. mask it's terrifying. which is horrible it's yeah. really really terrifying yeah. but it's incredible because it's a really pretty straightforward slasher mm-hmm. but it's shot like the most beautiful giallo movie you've ever seen so yeah. I think that's a really great one yeah it's nice when some of them have a, at least a little bit of kind of artistic you know a bit of artistry is, yeah, is always absolutely. quite a nice thing definitely um, can we talk about briefly one of my favourites from this early 80s era is Sleepaway Camp <sighs> Of course. <laughs> what are your... We can always talk about sleepaway camp. <laughs> Dear Mom and Dad, I've been at a sleepaway camp for almost three weeks. And I'm getting very scared. Welcome to sleepaway camp. How spoilery can I go here? Because Sleepaway Camp's a film that's almost impossible to talk about. Yeah. Really. Without talking without about Without revealing the what happens It's in true. It. And usually on this podcast, we do kind of full spoiler analysis of yeah. movies. But I feel like because this is kind of a bunch of small recommendations, let's avoid spoilers okay. for Sleepaway Camp. Yeah. So Sleepaway Camp essentially is a another kind of camp-based mm. slasher movie. So you've got poor young Angela who goes to a camp which is actually kind of like a younger camp than than most of these I mean you have the camp counsellors but actually a lot of the focus is on the kind of kids at the camp yeah Um, Angela is um, slightly kind of removed from everyone else she's shy she's quiet she's introverted Um, and while she is at camp her fellow camp mates and camp counsellors start to get bumped off Mm -hmm. who is behind these grisly murders you have to watch it and see yeah I mean this one's interesting because the characters a little bit younger yes, than we've seen before. Kids. Yeah. So yeah, we're talking kind of, you know, whereas Friday the 13th is about the camp counsellors, yeah. Sleepaway Camp's about the camp kids. Yeah. You know, it's about these little kids that are there and it's it's adds a, um, a real sense of strangeness to the film. Yeah, it it feels a little bit off. There's something a little bit kind of wrong with Sleepaway Camp, <laughs> yeah, which, you know, we won't spoil, but if you watch the whole thing, you'll find there's something very, very strange about um, about Sleepaway Camp. But, you know, I think whereas people 
often think about it in terms of being a kind of almost like a kind of kiddie slasher because it's not hugely mm, violent. No. But actually there's some really kind of edgy stuff in there. Yeah. And um and you know if we're talking about the uh, the ending which we won't spoil mm. in terms of representation and kind of queerness in in yeah. horror movies it's it's really interesting. Yes. And endlessly problematic. Yes, oh, yeah, oh, I was just about to say pro- problem like ahead of its time or or, or- terribly a kind of product of its time that's the that's yeah the question, I, I it? think it's a little bit of both you know yeah. and i think there was a kind of wave of, of films that were doing similar thing in terms of um you know i'm trying to again think of ways to talk about it not spoil it but in terms of kind of queer characters and particularly yeah. queer killers in um in horror movies and actually at the bfi um later um this month mm-hmm. well in the in the month of um months of november and december anyway we're yes. going to be doing a big thriller season yes and part of that that we're going to do is a, we're going to do a discussion about kind of queer killers mm. in thrillers but actually this will often be queer killers in films which you could talk about as slasher films things yeah. like dress to kill yes things yes. like silence of the week. lambs which yeah. aren't necessarily kind of slasher films in the traditional sense mm-hmm. but really interesting in how kind of killers in these films often kind of coded as queer yeah totally yeah i mean even going back to norman bates i suppose it's that same thing isn't it yeah not not always best to the sort of of trans um community is it no no definitely but but but, but i think what's interesting is you know you can kind of get to a point where you kind of go past that and you can actually start to reclaim these films absolutely and i think what's also interesting about some of these films and particularly sleepaway camp yeah is you know the the word camp is you know is has multiple meanings yeah, because it yeah. is there is something kind of extreme and stupid and kind of camp about it and yeah. i think actually for for queer audiences it's it works on many levels yes yes absolutely speaking of which what's your opinion of nightmare on elm street 2 because again that's kind of regarded as the ultimate mm. queer horror movie isn't it oh yeah i love it i mean it's, it's amazing <laughs> it had a, a big impact on me when i was a kid um and you know i never i never looked back um but yeah, yeah. i think it's you know it's it's again it's one of those films it's like slumber party massacre where we talked about when the subtext becomes text mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and you know when you when you hear the filmmakers for nightmare on Elm street 2 talking about how they didn't intend to make yeah. this gay slasher film it's like come on either you're lying or yeah. you're an absolute idiot because i mean <laughs> you know you've got a gym teacher who goes to this queer leather bar yeah and then afterwards gets strung up naked in the showers yeah. and whipped to death yes you know it's to it's, death it's, you yeah. know it's not you know, it's not <laughs> subtextual. It's not kind of find the hidden meaning here. It's, yeah. it's all out there and it's yeah. absolutely unashamedly gay. Yeah. Something is trying to get inside my body. Yeah, and she's female and she's waiting for you in the cabana. And you want to sleep with me. Um, all right, lovely. What's your what's your next recommendation? So my next choice is, uh, is one that I think is slightly classier than a lot of the stuff that came at the time. Mm-hmm. But not necessarily hugely well known, which is just before dawn. Okay. Run for your life. The nightmare has begun. It will find you in the hour when dream and reality merge. The last desperate moment of darkness. Oh, who is it? Just before dawn. Uh, it's got kind of shades of deliverance or something about right. it in its kind of woodland setting. Yeah. Um, and kind of in that, you know, you've got your kind of classic killer people being bumped off one by one yeah um it's really beautiful to look at it's really interesting i'm just looking at pictures of it it looks nice and arty oh yeah yeah that's a great picture there (laughs) um and it's by made by jeff lieberman who also made the film blue sunshine have you ever Mm -hmm. seen that which is you know the kind of bald bald people on lsd freaking out and and doing crazy things so i think he's a really interesting filmmaker yeah and it's i always love it when you see a you know, a kind of proper, legit filmmaker, someone yes. who's got a real point of view making a slasher movie, yes. you know, who's kind of adhering to these formulas and yep. these kind of, you know, and gets kind of almost like swept up in this kind of craze and these mm-hmm. films get labelled as such. But actually there's something slightly different. I think Just Before Dawn is one of those mm. that, that you know, if you kind of said to someone, you know, if someone said to me like, oh, I hate slasher films, yeah. you'll never convince me. That's always one that I would put forward and say, hey, give this one a go. Yeah. Paramount Pictures cordially invites you to the party. To end all parties. April Fool. <laughs> you are such a jerk. <laughs> one that i um that i do really love though is um which is a kind of controversial one i people fall into two camps either they think the twist is the best or the twist is the worst mm-hmm. but i love april fool's day oh yeah yeah, yeah, um, yeah. which uh, which yeah. again i won't spoil for anyone that hasn't seen it but it does have 
a, a kind of audience dividing twist, <laughs> which if you go with, yeah. you think it's the best thing you've ever seen, and if not, you'll want to throw your TV out. Yeah, the window. it's like an early Shyamalan film. Almost, yeah, exactly. You know, like, but, yeah. but good. Yeah, but good. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> also, instantly, for uh, April Fool's Day has my favourite. When I was a little kid, and I used to go to the video shop, and obviously I'd run straight to the horror section, mm-hmm. and I'd just stand there for like hours, just pouring over the the VHS covers. And April Fool's Day always had my favourite cover, mm-hmm. which was the girl with her back towards you with her hair I'm that right, was yeah. in a plait that was like a noose yeah. and all the people in front of her I just think that was incredible yeah do you know what that is so true as well because that is what I miss and we're going to sound like such old people but you know the, we the, are old people it's the, fine yeah the, the, the joy of going into a, a video shop and actually literally judging a film by its cover and, and gra- grabbing one because of the front cover you don't get that anymore do you yeah. that kind of era of oh what's this random obscure thing I've never heard of that yeah. I'm going to pick off a shelf yeah. you know? but of course inevitably the covers are always substantially better than the films, the films. used to pick from them yeah, so maybe true. it's maybe it's a good thing in some very, ways but no absolutely it's like I used to enjoy the process of going to the video shop and picking out a film as much if not more than I enjoyed getting home and actually watching that film totally. it was like the, the possibilities which is endless it was so exciting and yeah. I think that's something that you know I, I'll never in my life be able to so sad but be able to recapture the thrill of standing in the horror section at my local video shop I agree 100% agree and some of them were sc- like you say better than the film some of them were scarier than the films mm. as well I remember there were times I think It was one of them for me as a child where I was like mm, this is too much for me even yeah. from the front cover what do you think was do you have a, a kind of scariest ever horror movie front cover it doesn't have to be a slasher but um do you know what it wasn't the, the actually so much the front cover but for some reason when i was a kid the back cover with the the kind of stills from dolls oh, the Stuart Gordon dolls, film yeah, really yeah, freaked me out yeah. and there was a kind of sh- there was like a, one picture in particular it was like a kind of woman that had a head kind of bashed into a skirting board or something and it really stuck with me and for years i was really i was never scared of horror movies when i was a kid i just used to want to watch all of them there was something about dolls that I was like, <laughs> but I won't watch dolls. That's, that that's a step too far. And then eventually I saw the film and I was like, oh, it's, it's, it's so played rubbish. like a comedy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, kind yeah, of, yeah. you know, kind of later grew to really love Stuart Gordon. And now, you know, I can't imagine how I was ever frightened of this film. But that was the one. That, but I'd always pick it up as well. I'd always go yeah. to it and I'd look at it and be like, ooh, and oh, put yeah, it back. Yeah, 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 yeah. It had a good front cover, that one. I yeah, it did. So with the kind of doll. And she had an eye taken out. And she yeah. was, yeah, it's cool. It was good. I also remember Dolly Dearest. Do you remember yeah, Dolly Dearest? Which is rubbish. Terrible as well. But I thought from the front cover, it looked awesome. Yeah, Dolly Dearest is like when. When, when films try and imi- you know obviously that came after Chance Play and it's like yeah. this kind of idea of imitation but they try and do too much it's yeah. like Dolly Dearest has this insane uninteresting plot mm-hmm. it's like sometimes a killer doll is enough yeah 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 yeah, it's true and it's, it's so interesting because this era we've been talking about is kind of synonymous with that kind of VHS boom I suppose isn't mm-hmm. it video nasties and yeah. all of that kind of thing so it's, it's definitely worth a mention they thought their vacation would be fun they were wrong Dead wrong. The Mutilator. This is, I think it was originally released under a other title called Spring Break or Final Break okay. or something like that. Yeah. And then was subsequently released as The Mutilator. And it's just a gang of kids who go to this little kind of, you know, beach house that they've rented yep. and they get picked off one by one. Yeah. You know, again, no big surprise in terms of storytelling or yep. in terms of the the narrative, but the way it goes about doing it is is super beautiful and I think it's got some really wonderfully nasty kills. Mm-hmm. And I've got the tagline here Go on. which is by sword, by pick, by axe, bye bye. <laughs> I mean that's that's good. Another one actually which um which does kind of elevate itself above a lot of the 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 crop that was at the same time was um, the initiation, mm. which is another kind of sorority set slasher movie. But this one's a bit more interesting. It's very kind of rooted in psychoanalytic psychoanalytic theory, yeah. And it's all about kind of dreams and interpretations of dreams, mm-hmm. and you know, kind of repressed desires. And again, there's a kind of twin in there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's got your kind of classic um, slasher tropes, but but tries to do something that's a little bit more cerebral yeah. with it. Before the initiation begins, the subjects are studied. Even their dreams are recorded. Before the initiation begins, the testing areas are selected. The sorority house, the sanitarium, the empty shopping mall. And just before the initiation begins, a toast is required. Being young, staying young, and dying 
and um, and it's really interesting. It really pays off. It's one that benefits kind of multiple viewings. Yeah. And I think that you know, whereas a lot of the slasher films from the time you watch once, you've kind of got what you're going to get out of yeah. them. You know, once is enough. But I think the initiation is one that you, that definitely bears up for um to for repeated views. Looks like you're going to get a chance to meet the rest of the family. My psychotic brother just escaped. I bred everybody. <laughs> Here's to the new family. One of my favourites, which came a little bit later, I think this was from 1987, mm-hmm. is um, Blood Rage, Ooh, yes. um, which is a really, really good one um, about twin brothers, mm-hmm. one of whom was committed to a mental asylum um, who escapes horror and deaths ensue yeah um you know again the setup is classic slasher material you know um we talked about how quite often slasher movie narratives will evolve around revolve around a prank that goes wrong Mm -hmm. or there is things about like an evil twin is quite a common one yeah someone from an asylum who escapes is a common one yeah so there's a kind of few of these wrapped up in um in blood rage but while it's fairly pedestrian in its storytelling, it's so strange in its execution. Mm. It's kind of high camp, but takes itself really seriously. Yeah. It's really cheap and trashy, but kind of looks beautiful at the same mm-hmm. time. It's a real mix of of styles and tones. And, yeah. you know, I think you could sit there and one minute you're kind of laughing at it. The next you're laughing with it. The next you're just blown away by how beautiful it looks. Yeah. I think it's a really interesting one. And I think it's one that's... Um, super fun and super silly and trashy but again shows that quite often these films had something a bit more to give Mm -hmm. than just body counts excellent good choice yeah that's one of my faves as well really really good yeah Yeah, arrow did a arrow did a really beautiful reissue of it recently so brilliant stuff all right lovely next up on your list next up on my list is another uh, later one actually a, a kind of late 80s one which is intruder um, which is one um, set in a supermarket so it's a yeah supermarket set slasher um, super super styled mm. really beautiful to look at really interesting um, it was I think one of those kind of films that kind of got buried really it didn't really do very well when it first came out it mm-hmm. you know caused barely a ripple and people didn't really kind of think about it and then it became one of those talked about the great lost slasher film right, yeah, type yeah, yeah. things I mean we're talking about late 80s now so it was very much at the tail end of the boom and people yeah. had kind of lost interest yeah and I think a lot of the more interesting films of that time just were completely overlooked mm. and Intruder's definitely one of those it's um it's beautiful it's got um it's got almost a kind of Sam Raimi vibe sometimes in its kind of style and the, the kind of execution. It's, mm-hmm. uh, it's one that's really worth checking out. Fantastic. Lovely. All right. Yeah, I've, I've not seen that one. I should yeah. definitely check that out. And anything Any, set in a supermarket. Well, exactly. Anything that's kind of got like a novelty setting is yes. always good. I mean, we talked about, you know, um, kind of dates and stuff. But yes. I like a, you know, a fun slasher in a, in a, in a particular environment. It's yeah. nice to see one that's not set in a college. Yes. Or that's not set in a house. Yes. So, you know, a supermarket one's uh, particularly good novelty absolutely going back to Stephen King I mean my favourite Stephen King The Mist as well absolutely amazing exactly um, one of the highlights of the King season actually absolutely. was getting to show that in black and black white, and white. Yes. so yeah. that's how it was meant to be exactly. that's how we wanted it wasn't exactly. it yeah, it, yeah. Look, it should be black and white it yeah. looks so much better black and white I yeah, mean yeah, the thing yeah, about yeah. The Mist I love it completely mm. but you know the special the effects, effects are terrible yeah. and it's black and white's much more forgiving definitely of it. definitely it's a shame about the tv series it really is. anyway oh, yeah it really is uh, terrible <laughs> yeah. um, all right next on your slasher list curtains oh okay do you know curtains i now remind me is curtains is a good one curtains is um the one that everyone knows because it's got this incredible sequence in it mm-hmm. with um that's like an ice skating sequence in the mm-hmm. outdoors and there's a girl ice skating and there's a killer in a mask with a kind of I can't remember what it's called on those kind of <laughs> like a sickle or something. yeah like a sickle that's yeah, exactly yeah, what yeah. it is and um, this amazing beautiful insane ice skating mm-hmm. sickle death sequence nice. that actually the film itself is strange it's a bit of a mess it's ending was reshot it's slightly confusing it's storytelling but for this ice skating sickle scene alone yeah. it makes it worth seeing it. and i think of all the films produced at this time that's one of the kind of standalone sequences mm-hmm. in a slasher film ah! 
But one thing I wanted to talk about that I forgot before was this idea of kind of, you know, the, you've got these iconic scream queens and final girls. And obviously Jamie Lee Curtis was a huge part of this early 80s. Um, what is she, she? Obviously Halloween and then Halloween 2. And then she also did Prom Night, Terror Train. Um, what, what was it about Jamie Lee that, you know, what's your opinions on Jamie Lee and her performances in those movies? She was she was just different, wasn't she? Mm. She still you still look back at Halloween and you there's no one else like Jamie yeah. Lee Curtis. There's no kind of equivalent actress. I yeah. think it's that thing of, you know, people responding to someone relatable. Yeah. Someone that's not this insane babe that, you know, they're never gonna know or they're never gonna be. Yeah. You know, she's just that kind of girl that you know or that the girl that you are. Yes. You know, these kind of things. And I think, you know, it sounds like a real kind of um cliched way to talk about it but i mm. think it's really true mm. you know i think it's like you you liked her she was shy she was awkward yeah you know um and but she didn't rest on that i think mm-hmm. that wasn't the persona that she created mm. you know you look at jamie lee's kind of subsequent horror performances she's not that girl in no in terror train she's not always you know, Laurie she's Strode. absolutely yeah. she's and you know when she worked with carpenter again on the fog yeah you know they're not trying to replicate that thing she's a very different person yeah and i think you know jamie lee just as an actress as a kind of presence just offers something different you know yeah. she's she's entirely herself yeah in all of these roles. I think that's what's kind of interesting about her, that she doesn't... um, When we're at a time when films were basically trying to fit into these Mm moulds and they were doing stock characters and they were repeating the same thing over and over again, Mm -hmm. Jamie Lee Curtis kind of seemed to exist outside of that. She was always her own entity. And I think, you know, she's particularly interesting in terms of, you know, we've touched upon this idea of kind of feminism or or if feminism can exist within horror cinema. And I think, you know, she's one of the the kind of poster girls, as it were, because, you know, she does bring an agency to all of her performances, which I think so many kind of... um, similar horror heroines lacked yeah and i think she still to this day embraces it doesn't she i mean another other thing you know you get people like for instance jennifer aniston who started off in the leprechaun who will kind of deny or not ever want to acknowledge that that's where she started jamie lee curtis seems to really you know when she does things now like scream queens and she's mm. doing another halloween next mm. year you know she really seems to embrace that horror her mm. horror roots i suppose yeah she? absolutely and you know and she's an interesting one anyway you know there's a kind of she has a kind of masculinity about her yeah. which is so fascinating to watch yeah and you know so much of the rules and so much of the stuff that we think about in terms of the final girl being mm. you know slightly kind of masculine not just in terms of of their name but in terms of you know their kind of the way they act the way they respond yeah. to the killers they, the way they respond to the characters around them you know so much of that came from Jamie Lee Curtis mm. you know this wasn't stuff that John Carpenter had written this was stuff that she brought to the role yeah. and I think people often talk about Halloween and talk about John Carpenter as shaping the films to come but I don't think people give Jamie Lee that no. credit because a lot of the heroines that followed were trying to emulate her they didn't do it maybe always very successfully but you can see the you know you can see the legacy of Laurie Mm -hmm. in the girls that followed absolutely yeah Um, and very briefly before we finish I'll run through I just want to hear what your thoughts are on some of the bigger ones I suppose to come out of that Um, so we'll just quickly go from I mean Prom Night um, I like I like Prom Night. I yeah. think Prom Night's good. Um, I think the films. I think the films really fun. Um, I think its best asset is Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah. Um, I think it does what you want it to do. Yeah. It's one yeah. of those slash films. We talked about those slash films that you can watch once. And that's enough. And yeah. I think Prom Night is one of those. Absolutely. Good disco music. Good, yeah. uh, good product of its time, I suppose. What about The Prowler? The Prowler's great. The Prowler's nasty. Mm-hmm. The Prowler's got an edge to it. I think the Prowler is um is one that feels so many of these slash films at the time felt safe. Yes. Felt like you know what's gonna come. Yes. And you know you can predict the kills. You you know who's gonna go and you know when the camera's gonna cut away. Mm. There's something about the Prowler which didn't quite cut away when <laughs> yes. you thought it was going to. It was yes. a bit nastier. And um and it's you know, it's it's not necessarily one of my favourites, but it's definitely one that I think is um most distinctive. It was 1945, the night of the graduation dance. The war overseas had just ended. The terror at home Boy. was about to begin. <coughs> the Prowler. If he wants you, he'll get you. And I actually think the set, the death scenes from the Prowler are really mm. like 
brutal. They, they, they're not just gory, but they have a kind of viciousness to yeah. them almost. Do you know what I mean? And that, that one in the shower with the pitchfork yeah. is still extremely convincing Yeah, as well. absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I think The Prowler, The Prowler's got something um, to it. When I think about that film, that film, I think about it as being harsher than the others i think about it being yeah, darker it and is. i think about it being less fun than <laughs> yes. the other slash films around the same time there's yes. something um there's something kind of mean-spirited about it and it, i mean that uh, in the with the highest praise you know it's <laughs> yeah. a great thing but um, but um but also i think the prowler is for me very much a film that i don't remember anyone in it no. i don't remember anything about it no. other than the kills yeah. the kills are great but i think there's um you know, it's um, it's not one that that I had a kind of emotional. No, totally. To so much. There's an attempt at a kind of plot set up at the beginning where it's set in World War Two, and yeah, there's a letter being yeah, written, yeah. and then it kind of abandons yeah. that. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what is your favourite? Before we finish, what's your favourite slasher kill? Um, my favourite slasher kill. I mean, I think my kind of top ones would be the um, the sleeping bag kill in. Oh God, I'm going blank. Is it? Part, Friday 13th part 6 7 or I, think seven. It's I think seven. it's 7 yeah. Yeah. 6 is the really great one seven is 7 is terrible but with the great it's sleeping like bag Carrie kill. versus Jason yes exactly <laughs> but the sleeping bag kill in that is amazing yes. although you know as with all the kind of latter Fridays is yeah. very sad because they were just hacked by the American censors yeah. and I think that original sleeping bag kill was supposed to be much more um extravagant mm. than it ended up being but i think the power of that one bash against the tree <laughs> is always uh, is always pretty good um apart from the aforementioned sleeping bag yeah. death um i bet i'm not the first one to say first person to say this but um the the raft sequence in the burning oh yeah um it's you just you're the first person oh really oh, actually sure we haven't mentioned the burning well here we are now this finally. is a good segue well, yeah yeah, yeah. Do, but i mean that scene is just absolutely incredible it's you know so much happens in such a short amount of time yeah it's genuinely horrific yeah There's something really nasty about it. Yeah. Um, it's it's just an amazing moment. And every, you know, I, I've watched The Burning many times. And for me, The Burning is the build up to that scene. Yeah. And is. then the come down afterwards. It you is. Know, it's, it's absolutely an incredible, and of, incredible sequence. And of course, you know, again, going back to when I first watched it as a teenager, for me, that movie was that scene. I remember seeing pictures of it. I remember hearing about it through word of mouth. And almost the disappointment, I think, of when I watched it for the first time going, when is this scene going to happen? Yeah, I was yeah. literally just waiting for that set piece, basically. Yeah. And it was worth the wait. Yeah. But um, you're right. It doesn't quite... Nothing else in that movie lives up to that yeah. moment. I mean, I feel I like being mean because, I mean, that sets the bar so high, that scene. The it rest does. of the movie's good. Like, it I like good. the burning a lot. You know, it there's a lot good. of kind of fun to be had. But but that scene is, is genuinely extraordinary. Yeah. You've formed a kind of relationship with these people. Mm. And the way that they're systematically killed in such a brutal, <laughs> unforgiving and quite abrupt way, yes. I think makes it even more cruel. You know, so often in slasher films, people are killed one on one. Yeah. So you kind of get a sense of their kind of pain and their yeah. death and you get to say goodbye to them. Whereas in The Burning, it's a, a kind of moment of mass killing. And yeah. I think it's something you don't see that often in slasher films. It's true. They're and usually th- all se- separated, aren't exactly. they, deliberately? Yeah. Exactly. And I think it's what makes it so much more shocking and so mm-hmm. much more cruel in some ways. Yeah. And it's it's in, it's in the daylight as well, isn't it? Which again, is quite unusual, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. No, definitely. It's um, There's something kind of... It, it, it doesn't hide behind anything it's no. just up front it's just there it's it's just a massacre and it's really um it's still quite upsetting to it watch is. it and i think it's you know even when you talk about kind of slasher kills you think about the ones you know the goriest or the most mm-hmm. painful or the ones that make you cringe but mm. there's that one in the burning it's it's nasty yes it you is know, there's a real edge to it and, and i think that's what's great about that film it's true and there are images that are just kind of forever burnt into my like you, you i can picture exactly you know like the kind of silhouette mm. of the guy holding it's the so shears good. the 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 finger you know everything it's like you you never forget that scene it's brilliant um and the other one as well that i really love is um tatum's death in scream in the um <laughs> in the cat flap in the uh in the garage door i think is it's it's a great moment. So the, the, there's a there's a annoying nerdy part of me that hates. There's a kind of bad continuity in that. Have you ever noticed that she's further through that cat flap, that dog flap, in one shot it's, than she is in the other? It is true. But I am one of these weird people that I love bad continuity. <laughs> I, I love the flaws in things. It just makes me. It makes me uh, feel 
you know, it makes me feel more love for them. Yes, it is nasty. So. You don't even quite really understand what's happened to her. Was she squashed? Was yeah. she electrocuted? Like, so what's happening? Her, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's a bit weird. And, and she's, a, you know, that's an interesting one because I think slasher films work best when there's an edge of sadness mm. to them. I think the thing that sometimes the less successful slasher films don't do is to really think about that these are young people being killed. Yeah. You know, these are young people having their lives taken away from them. Yeah. And it's that like you need that moment where, you know, because because essentially these films were about young people for young people. It's, yeah. you know, cinemas full of teenagers that are watching these movies. Mm. You need to be able to kind of relate. You need to have that sense of empathy. Mm-hmm. And I think where the slasher movie is at its worst is when it loses that sen- sense of empathy. Yeah. And I think Scream was really great at being that kind of empathetic yes. horror movie that you kind of relate to and you understand. And so therefore, when Tatum dies, you don't want to cheer, yeah. you want to cry. Yeah, I think that's so true. And that's the the best ones, as we've already mentioned, are those ones, I think, where you get a sense of character um, more than you do the killer, I suppose. And that's what happened with a lot of the worst sequels, I mm. think it's all about that. But, you know, that I think that's why, you know, my favourite is probably Black Christmas, weirdly. And I think I, I just love those characters. I think Margot mm. Kidder, all of those brilliant actors, and they spend a lot of time giving you enough backstory about each and every one of these characters. And then when the, do, the kills do happen, they sort of pack a punch, I think. Mm. Yeah, in that yeah, respect. Yeah, and I, you know, Black Christmas is interesting as well because it does you know it's not just a slasher film there's a kind no. of police procedural in yeah. there and there's you know there's kind of stuff about kind of familial relationships mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. again about kind of sisterhood and stuff that we've, yeah. we've already talked about I think there's you know there's kind of multiple entry points to that film and yeah. kind of different ways that you can talk about it yeah. so you know I always think when people talk about Black Christmas as just a slasher film it's mm-hmm. kind of diminishes what oh, it is totally. in, in some ways it's so much more so. but it has also got my fa- probably my favourite kill scene is that one is the glass unicorn while the carol singers are sitting, and yeah. that kind of cuts between the two yeah. I, lo- I think it's beautiful yeah. and terrifying I, I absolutely love it yeah I love I mean I love a Christmas slasher film oh. there's a few good ones I mean one that we haven't talked about is um, is Silent Night Deadly oh Night my God, which yes. I absolutely love yeah and um, you know, and it was, you know, it's the, the kind of killer Santa slasher yeah. film. It was the night before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. Hugely controversial when it came out, yeah. kind of, you know, different um, conservative groups in the States were trying to get it banned yeah. and, you know, it got pulled from cinemas, all this kind of thing. You know, you can't sully the good name of, um, of Father Christmas. Yeah. But kind of looking back now, it's really weird, strange <laughs> film. Tonally, it's all over the place. And is. what is great about that film is that the protagonist is the antagonist. Yeah. So, you know, your killer is your your kind of person that you're there with and that you're rooting for rooting against wherever you might you might stand but you kind of understand his journey yes to being this kind of homicidal santa claus um which is uh which is fun and it's nice to be on the kind of other side of um of the kind of killer spectrum yeah it's a great movie and actually you reminded me of probably my favorite film at fright fest this year which i think is getting a release next month no, what's it called? Never be- better, be- watch, better out. watch out. Oh, oh so good. <laughs> loved that movie. And for anyone listening, just I think read as little about it as possible. Yes. Don't watch the trailer yes. as well because Don't. the trailer already gives away way too so much. So frustrating. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Pleasure of that film is not knowing what's going to come. Yeah. Um, yeah. That so. is going to be a movie I'm going to revisit at Christmas times to come. I yeah. just absolutely loved it. Hundred yeah. percent. And another uh, another one that I really like is. Um, similarly titled to Silent Night Deadly Night which mm. is Silent Night Bloody Night mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which is a kind of um, earlier 70s it's kind of like a slasher precursor I guess it's yeah. not quite a slasher movie it's more like a whodunit yeah, yeah, I yeah. guess as they often um, were those early ones yeah but yeah. you can definitely see the kind of formula and you yeah. can see the, the subgenre kind of being mm-hmm. built um, and it's a really strange grubby little kind of surprisingly artistic film Mm -hmm. which is also notable because several of the kind of Andy Warhol's group feature in it yeah yeah, so you've got you know like I think Andy Darling's in it like Mary Warren of you know all these kind of people that are um that are kind of associated with with uh with Andy Warhol in this funny little grubby yuletide whodunit love it absolutely yeah 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 um all right lovely anything else you want to mention i I was thinking actually about um i mean i know we're kind of focused on 
the kind of 80s period and this yeah. kind of heyday of, of slash films. But I was kind of thinking as well about more recent slash films that I've mm-hmm. liked and, you know, if there's been any that I think are particularly good or particularly deserving of a shout out. And I actually think one of my favourites from the last few years and probably one that will go into my kind of all-time favourite list is the remake for The Town That Dreaded Sundown. Right, yeah. Which, yeah. Um, which was out a few years ago and really was kind of overlooked and still never has had that no. kind of its moment in the sun that it yeah. that it deserves um i think it's really extraordinary you know i think it very much is a product of that kind of postmodern mm-hmm. slasher boom mm-hmm. um, which of course started with scream yeah. i mean well perhaps it started before that but scream was the one that made yes. it big and um you know so it's it's very much about kind of constantly referring to this as a film and talking about it in terms of the film and mm-hmm. actually you know, the original film exists in the world of the yes. remake. And in many ways, it's not a traditional slasher film, but it's at its heart, there's a kind of slasher core there. Absolutely. And I think it does something really, really smart. And I think it's one that I always say to people that they should check out and they should watch because it just kind of came and went and yeah. no one seemed to care about it. Also, I think you you mentioned last time we spoke, you know, that you'd like to see more slasher films that are more akin to those early 80s ones that maybe do take themselves seriously. And although this one does have a, a postmodern thing, it is all, it is also just quite an earnest slasher movie, yeah. it feels like, isn't absolutely, it? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's the thing that, you know, when people talk about this kind of ironic slasher yeah, film. You know, the kind tragedy of tragedy your... girls and final girls and all these recent ones. You know, are... and things, you know, these films are super fun. They're yeah. really enjoyable. But the thing is, they're not scary. Yeah. You know, they're not played for, for thrills. They're not mm. made to make you feel uncomfortable mm-hmm. and um, to shock and to horrify in the same kind yeah. of way. And that's why something like Town That Dreaded Sundown is so great because, yeah, like you said, it's earnest. Yeah. You know, it's trying to be something a bit darker and a bit more kind of unsettling. And I think it does it really well. And I think it shows that you can be both things. Mm -hmm. You can be, you know, in inverted commas, ironic. You can be postmodern. You can be contemporary. Yeah. But you can still kind of be a throwback. You can still be something that works on a purely horror level. I wonder if just, you know, it went on at at that time. And I think, again, you mentioned last time, you know, we're just not at a place at the moment where people necessarily want these kind of earnest slashes. But, you know, I wonder if it will eventually, with hindsight, sort of come to the fore, if if that sort of boom happens again Mm. one day down the line. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I think we're at a real interesting turning point for horror at the moment with it of course, mm-hmm. which has been huge. It's mm-hmm. been hugely successful. Big, big bucks. And, you know, it is unashamedly a horror movie yeah. that's designed to scare people. Yeah. You know, it's got jokes in there, but the jokes aren't at the expense of the horror. Yes. They're kind of an aside. But um, I think what's kind of interesting is, you know, studios sometimes have been shying away from horror recently and trying to kind of describe their films in other ways post-horror post-horror elevated genre psychological thrillers all these ways to describe films that are basically horror films it can only be described as a horror film so it's been great to see that's been so successful because hopefully now we'll see a new wave of kind of big studios embracing the term horror Mm. and being like let's give people what they want and let's try and scare the shit out of them yeah so you know and i'm hoping that a kind of a little mini slasher resurgence comes yeah, with that as well because I think it's time I think it's been a while since we've had a pure balls to the wall slasher movie yeah I wonder because it's 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 the, 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 the ones that are doing so well are these ones that have relatively little gore and are sort of more that sort of PG-13 level I mm. suppose aren't they you just need some studios to take the chance with doing a kind of R-rated 18 certificate yeah absolutely gory movie absolutely. fingers crossed that will happen yeah. um, well thank you so so much for joining me once again on the podcast um, you're a very busy man so thank you very much for that um, so we've done Stephen King now we've done LFF what's next for you what have you got coming up a couple of good things coming up in the cult strand. Um, perfect timing that I talked about Silent Night, Bloody Night, because yeah. we're going to be screening that this Christmas. Mm-hmm. So we're doing a kind of Christmas double bill of Silent Night, Bloody Night and Tales from the Crypt, the oh, Amicus God. anthology, which is the one best known for having Joan Collins versus yes. the Killer Santa Amazing. as one of its stories. Um, so that's a kind of Christmas um horror fest that's happening in bfi and then in the new year we're going to kick things off in january with a couple of similarly themed horror movies so we're going to do new year's evil which is a slasher film that we haven't talked about yet (laughs) yeah yeah, a very strange one um (laughs) and um bloody new year the latter being one of uh, the 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 later outputs from Norman J. Warren, who's known for much better films <laughs> than than Bloody New Year, and excellent. it's kind of really New Year themed, 
mainly only in its title. Right, yeah. yeah <laughs> so, yeah, you know, yeah. if you're like, oh, I desperately want to watch a really good New Year's film, probably bloody New Year's, not the one to go for. <laughs> New Year's <laughs> Evil might be the one. Yes. But, you know, I thought, what what better way to uh, to bring in the um, 2018 with a couple yeah. of films with New Year What a lovely title. double bill. Excellent. And this month, as in November, um, you've got, is it this month you've got La Residencia coming up and you've got a couple yeah, of Yeah, so kind of October, November, was oh, we're October, doing November. A, a couple of screenings. So we're doing La, La Residencia, which is also known as The House That Screamed. Yeah, what, this is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Beautiful, yeah. bizarre, yeah. wonderful film. And then the... Um, the second film that the director made, one of the uh, the second of only two films that he made, mm. which is Who Can Kill a Child? Oh, God, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was a shame, which is kind of an interesting one. It's a, a couple who go to this island, which is populated only by kids. Mm. And it's very much a kind of precursor for Children of the Corn mm-hmm. in, in lots of ways in terms of yes. these kind of homicidal kids existing yeah. in this child-only space. It's infinitely better than Children of the Corn, yes, which held really a special is. place in my heart for, but it's a terrible <laughs> film in many ways. Oh, well. But Who Can Kill a Child is, you know, is high art as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, totally. Amazing. Nobody does it better than the Spanish. Those, Especially those types of kind of gothic ghost stories like Residencia, yeah. you know, it's so good. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, people always talk about, you know, we talk about kind of Italian horror and have this very solid understanding yeah. of what Italian horror cinema is. Yeah. But I think... Um, I'd love to do a kind of big Spanish, Hispanic horror oh season God, here at BFI. Yeah. I think there's so much stuff to draw on. Yeah, totally. You know, I think until Tombs of the Blind Dead is playing in <laughs> NFT1, my job is not done. Yeah, absolutely. Keep on going. Um, wonderful. Well, thank you so, so much for joining me. And that's it for this week. Thank you so, so much for listening. And a big thank you to my guest, Michael Blythe, once again. Man, that guy has seen a lot of movies. Such a treat to sit down and chat slashes with him. In case you feel like you were a little bit bombarded with movie titles there and facts and clips of girls screaming, I'm going to give you a little rundown, a little brief conclusion, a breakdown of everything we've just discussed. If you're looking for slasher recommendations... So, if you're after sort of the real die-hard traditional 80s slashers that very much fit the mould in every way, that they're scary, they're full of decent, gory kills, I'd go with either Prom Night or Terror Train from 1980, The Prowler, The Burning, or My Bloody Valentine from 1981. If you're looking for a slasher that's slightly more camp, maybe a bit more fun, maybe takes itself a bit less seriously, something that you might want to watch and laugh at with your mates, I'd go with Pieces from 1983, Sleepaway Camp from 1983, Silent Night, Deadly Night from 1984, or April Fool's Day from 1985. How about if you're looking for something with a little bit less score, but focuses more on characters, on the writing, on the psychology? There's not many of those in the slasher pantheon, but there are a couple. Try Final Exam from 1981 or The Initiation from 1984. If you're looking with something with a little bit more ambition, maybe with a bit more style, a bit of artistry, a bit of visual flair, something where a director has tried doing something a little bit different, maybe it's not always worked, but it's ambitious, try Just Before Dawn from 1981, Curtains from 1983, The Mutilator from 1984, or Stage Fright and Blood Rage from 1987. All of those films are movies where the directors have kind of tried to do something a little bit different and in some of those instances they've really pulled off something extraordinary. And finally, if you're looking for a slasher that breaks the mould, that subverts the tropes, that kind of celebrates everything that these 80s slashers are all about, but also lends a bit of a critical eye, an artistic eye and also a feminist eye, then Michael Blythe's ultimate pick for the 80s slasher boom is Amy Holden Jones's Slumber Party Massacre from 1982. That is his number one slasher choice. So if you're looking for just one movie to check out amongst all of those, I'd go for that one. Well, that's about it for now. If you do want to get in touch, please do drop me an email. It's evolutionofhorror at gmail.com or tweet me at evolutionpod. You can also post on our Facebook page. That's the Evolution of Horror on Facebook. Please do drop me a little line wherever you can, however you can. It's great to hear from you guys. And I will be reading audience feedback and general comments on movies and slashes later on down the line towards the end of this series. So it'd be really, really great to hear from you. So, what have we got coming up next week? Well, you may have noticed that in amongst all of those 80s slasher movies we discussed today, there was one very important key 
80s slasher movie we didn't mention. This is the movie that changed everything. It gave new life to the slashers in the mid 80s as they were on the brink of dying out. It added a bit of a supernatural twist and it sparked not only one of the biggest horror franchises but also one of the most iconic horror movie characters since Frankenstein's monster. I am of course talking about Wes Craven's A Nightmare on Elm Street. Wes Craven, my favourite horror movie director, very, very excited to finally get to discuss a Wes Craven movie uh, next week. So as this is, in my opinion, probably the most quintessentially 80s horror movie you can imagine, I've managed to get the guy who is the expert on all things 80s teen movies. In fact, he's actually currently writing and about to publish a book all about 80s teen movies. He's a big fan of this movie and I'm a big fan of his. He was the Radio 1 film critic for years, all the while I was growing up. I listen to him every single week and he now occasionally covers Mark Kermode on Radio 5 Live and various other outlets. I am of course talking about the brilliant James King. So me and James will be discussing all things Elm Street next week. Join me then for all of this and more on the evolution of horror. Horror. 